Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Real, honest, entertaining, live. DBL starts right now. Three, two, one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Welcome to DBL. It's Thursday, March 4th. I'm Jeff here with my girls, Stephanie and Erica. How are we feeling like that? Oh. I'm feeling great. I don't know what this dance is called, but I'm, I'm excited I about like it. it. You didn't even have to talk. It was just I pitch. know. You didn't even need words with those movements. Hey, Steph, you, you, know. want to bust the, you want to challenge that or no? <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty oh, good. okay. That was all pretty right, good. you got See, it. You, you got stopped it. Stopped there. You committed and went I all went the way. I went all the way in. I enjoy it. All right, here we go. Chris Harrison is speaking out for the first time since stepping back from The Bachelor. Chris spoke to Michael Strahan on GMA today for and apologized for comments he made during an interview with former Bachelorette Rachel Lindsay, where he defended a, con a contestant for attending an Old South party on a plantation back in 2018. Let's watch. I am an imperfect man. I made a mistake and I own that. I believe that mistake doesn't reflect who I am or what I stand for. I am saddened and shocked at how insensitive I was in that interview with Rachel Lindsay. And I didn't speak from my heart. And that is to say I stand against all forms of racism and I am deeply sorry. I'm sorry to Rachel Lindsay and I'm sorry to the black community. So after the interview, Michael Strahan seemed to question whether his apology was sincere. Let's have a look. Well, his, his apology is his apology, but it felt like it got nothing more than a surface response on any of this. And obviously, he's the man who wants to clearly stay on the show, but only time will tell if there is any meaning behind his words. How did you guys feel about the apology? Did you feel like Michael Strahan or did you believe he was sincere in his apology? I would have liked for him to come and um, give that apology with the same energy that he had that conversation with Rachel Lindsay Abasolo. And the reason why that's super important right now is because what has happened to Rachel Lindsay as a result of that interview. If you'll notice, she is no longer on social media because people have come for her like no other. She was already under, the, under fire for being the first black bachelorette. That was a tremendous thing to take on. And she did so with grace and dignity. She led that conversation with Chris Harrison with grace and dignity. And and that's the problem with what's happening right now. All the vitriol that she's receiving is completely unwarranted. And it's only because she's a black woman and that was the situation. If you watch that interview, she never once came for his neck. Never once, and she absolutely could have. She navigated that conversation diplomatically. She navigated that conversation with restraint, but also with a degree of education and poise. For her to be getting what she's getting right now is completely unfair, and we all need to be looking at how the situation has unfolded. I think he should go maybe back. Is she, she's still working for Extra, is that correct? Right. For Extra. Why doesn't he just go back and do another, like, sit-down interview and explain what he just told Michael Strahan? I feel like he should do another interview with Rachel Lindsay, right? Oh, would that maybe I would clear the air? I would love to see that happen. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how Extra do handle this. Like you said, she's obviously taken a step back from social media because of the harassment and stress that she's being caused to caused because of this, because of this man and the things that he said when she's just speaking the truth, like you said, with poise and dignity, she did an incredible job. Um, I'm intrigued to see what that what extra are going to do to support not only her, but maybe to encourage like what you just said, Jeff, maybe he d he should come back on. Maybe he should explain that. And also it was interesting when um, Michael said, I don't really feel almost like the energy isn't genuine is kind of what he was saying. And um, it's funny if you watch that interview and how the conviction in which he said what he said to Rachel when he was like, I don't see what's wrong with it. It's 2018. We're not. It's, was it wrong then or now? Um, it being, I didn't get the same energy when he was apologizing. And I thought at the start when he said, I'm going to take a step back, I'm going to step down. Then a few weeks later, it's almost going, oh, my bank account isn't as high. I better go back and now say sorry. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but it felt as though it felt a little contrived and a little, a little too late for me. I'd have rather him said there in the moment or gone back on like the next day or, you know, done a bit of research, done had a bit of education, have his team talk to him, like wrap his head around what he said and why it's affected so many people and now this poor girl and her job. And instead he just sits low for a few weeks and comes back with like a half-hearted apology, like, I don't know. Right, yeah, I could, I could 
get down with talking more about Chris Harrison, but what ha what's happening to Rachel Lindsay is absolutely unacceptable. That's right. not a conversation. Okay, we're getting more details about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's highly anticipated sit-down interview with Oprah this weekend. In this preview, Meghan throws shade on the monarchy, monarchy, monarchy Steph, I was going to try to go to you, but on the monarchy, <laughs> and suggests the royals are responsible for spreading lies about them. Let's watch. How do you feel about the palace hearing you speak your truth today? I don't know how they could expect that after all of this time, we would still just be silent if there is an active role that the firm is playing in perpetuating falsehoods about us. And if that comes with risk of losing things, I mean, I've, there's a lot that's been lost already. Ooh, so in case you missed that, she referred to the monarchy as the firm. Meghan refers to the royal family as the firm right there. The late Princess Diana used the same term to describe the royals during her infamous BBC interview back in 1995. And the firm also has dark undertones. It was the title of a John Grisham book and Tom Cruise movie about a shady law firm and its involvement with the mob. Great movie, by the way. But let's go back to Meghan Markle. She called them the firm. Mm. What I do you mean, think about that? I stuff? think Meghan is really smart, and I think she is playing the royals as much as they're trying to play her. So, in terms of, like, for instance, the outfit that she wore, she went for a de very different style to what she normally does with like bright, bold colors. She wore a very dark, subdued color. I think that means because she's here to talk business. She wore Diana's jewelry, a very subtle piece. Again, when Diana was giving all those interviews, and Diana referred to them as being the firm. And the firm is it's accurate. I don't think she's being rude in any way, shape, or form. Um, as Colin first said when he played King George back in 2010, um, he said, we're not a family, we're a firm, and it's true. They're, the Royals is a big business with more ups and downs than the stock market, and uh, they've got a lot to lose by the two key players that could be the future of that, breaking free and speaking free, because mm -hmm. a lot of people have done that in the past, and they've not been given the voice, and they haven't had the power, but a lot of people are supporting them, and I think Meghan is playing it the right way, and I think, obviously, we're seeing articles being leaked to the press demeaning her character at a very convenient time but you know you're going up against you're going up against the monarchy I mean yeah. so is the firm quickly is that a term they use in the UK oh gosh no it's, it's quite insulting it's, All right, you know, I just wanted to... she's saying you know I'm against like the mob here you know my voice has been silenced Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to that interview. Me too. Sunday on She's CBS. Broke. Me too. We will be talking about it on Monday, I promise, if not tomorrow as well. Coming up on DBL, rock and roll secrets you've never heard before from a photographer who got up close and personal with some of the world's biggest acts. You don't want to miss that. Don't go away. Closed captioning provided by. <laughs> young, I was poor, I was black, and I did not know anything about the law. Verify is here to dispel misinformation, answer your questions, and break down complex topics. On February 26th, the Archdiocese of New Orleans issued this statement about the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine, calling it morally compromised because they say it used cells from an aborted fetus in developing the vaccine. So let's verify if this is true. Did Johnson & Johnson use aborted fetal cells to develop the vaccine? Here are the sources, a Johnson & Johnson spokesperson and Dr. Namanje Bumpus, a professor and director of the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. First, let's talk about the cells which are being referenced. In 1973 and 1985, fetal cells were taken from two aborted fetuses. Scientists have been replicating those original cells for decades now and using them to create and test all kinds of medicines and therapies. They're called fetal cell lines. This is not new. This is, you know, very standard. These cells have made a huge contribution to medicine and drug discovery and drug development. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine specifically uses a cell line called the PER-C6 cell line. A Johnson & Johnson spokesperson confirmed for us that this is the cell line that they used to create their adenovirus vaccine. However, they also confirmed that there's no fetal tissue in the vaccine itself. So we can verify that yes, 
Fetal tissue cells that have been alive and multiplying for almost 40 years are used in the production of the vaccine. Now we should point out that this is not the viewpoint of all Catholic leaders. In December, the Vatican said that if there's no other option, it's morally acceptable to receive vaccines with connections to aborted fetal tissue. And the Archdiocese of Washington directed us to a statement that says the same. With your Verify, I'm Evan Kozlov. Welcome back to DBL. Imagine going to work and your co-workers are Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, Ringo, and Paul. That's literally the life of rock and roll photographer Rob Shanahan. You've seen his work, now hear his stories from the man behind the camera. He spoke with Tori earlier in part one of our series, Rock Legends. I'm so excited for this interview. Joining us is legendary music photographer Rob Shanahan. Welcome, Rob, to Daily Blast Live. Wow, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You are living the life so many music fans dream about, my husband included. Is there one client, like, it's always strange to me when I do interviews, sometimes someone will just take your breath away or leave you a little more starstruck than others. Was there someone that you were sort of starstruck by? So many times. I know. When, when I was shooting Paul and Ringo together, oh. you know, looking through my viewfinder and in the rhythm section of the Beatles. I mean, those moments just take your breath away. My first time shooting Aerosmith, Steven Tyler, just, yeah. you know, everything you would hope he would be, he is. He's that guy you see on stage, on TV, and it just took my breath away. Also, you know, anything with the Rolling Stones, yeah. just, you know, such iconic guys and, I became really good friends with Charlie, the drummer, and, you know, whenever I get to go out with the Rolling Stones, I mean, just pinch myself yeah. thinking about it. Talk to me about those certain images. I want to talk about the Van Halen poster. Tell me about that. That was 2005. I got the call from band management. Van Halen called, hey, we need you to come up to Boise, Idaho to shoot the band. And, you know, those phone calls, every time I get a call like that, it's like, what? Really? <laughs> Van Halen? Pinch me. You know, that was one of my favorite bands in high school. I was that kid driving around with Van Halen blaring out of my car stereo. Yeah. So to get those calls is just amazing. And, you know, I, I went up there and Alex, the drummer, Alex Van Halen, I was a big hero of mine and meet him. And, you know, at Soundcheck, we just connected on such a level. And, you know, at the end of Soundcheck, he told me, he said, look, I talked to the band and we want you to go on stage anywhere you want during the show. And I just freaked out. Wow, on stage with Van Halen. So. That moment of Eddie Van Halen on stage, he was saluting Brother Alex doing a drum solo. And it's seriously, it's a two second moment of time. He dropped to a knee, saluted, got back up. Uh, I fired two frames and I knew if if one of those was, uh, you know, super sharp and focused, it was going to be memorable, and it's, you know, holds up. It's Since iconic. 2005, it's still one of my favorite photos. It's iconic. I love the movement in it. I also want to bring up the most recognizable photos, or one of them. You have the Paul McCartney kissing Ringo Starr on the cheek. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to hear, I love this, I love this. It's so playful of Paul and so r yeah. cool of Ringo. What's the story behind this photo? Well, they walked onto my set, and... As you said before, you know, being prepared, right, opportunity. Right. I was so prepared. I had my lighting all set and first frame, you know, Paul leaned in to give Ringo a kiss thinking I wasn't going to be ready and I just fired it off and that was frame one. Wow. Of the show. It was just being ready to go. Wow. It just says a lot about their personality in one image. I think it's a really great, great shot. Rob, I could yeah. listen to your stories all day. We're running out of time. Luckily, though, viewers at home can see more of your amazing work. I will be heading Thanks. to robshanahan.com. Also, check out his book, Volume 1, Through the Lens of a Music Photographer. This is a good coffee table or a book to read when you are uh, feeling the groove. How dumb do I sound? Feeling the groove. Oh, that sounded pretty cool. And don't forget, <laughs> <laughs> We're working on volume two. Ooh. Stay tuned. Lots of great surprises. I can't wait. Oh, I cannot wait. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a pleasure. Rock out. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. We're not done rocking and rolling with Rob. Coming up on DBL, more stories behind iconic photos and what it's really like to be Ringo Starr's personal photographer. We'll be right back.
Medical misinformation is everywhere online. And that's why the Verify team turns to the vetted experts to fact check claims like these, which say that people who wear glasses are up to three times less likely to catch COVID. So let's verify. Are people who wear glasses less likely to develop COVID-19? Our sources are two professors, Dr. Sonul Tooley at the University of Florida and Dr. Catherine Colby at NYU Langone Health. We also looked at this study, a research article out of India. Here's what our experts had to say about this claim. So at this point, we cannot tell you for certain. We don't have any evidence. This claim started to get attention when news outlets caught wind of a study out of India, which looked at 304 patients with mild COVID-19, concluding that those who wore glasses for more than eight hours a day or sunglasses outside were two to three times less likely to catch COVID-19. Dr. Colby pointed out that this study is only a preprint, which means it hasn't been peer reviewed. I don't put any stock in, in publications that haven't gone through the peer-reviewed process. In fact, the website that published the report says that preprints, quote, should not be relied on to guide clinical practice or health-related behavior and should not be reported in news media as established information. Even the author noted the limitations, writing that the sample size was small, the study period was short, and that, quote, more studies should be done to know the effects of using spectacles on the epidemiology of COVID-19. It's a good pilot study, something that we want to look at and then build from. So we can verify that our experts say at this point, there's no definitive evidence that glasses wearers have a smaller risk of developing COVID-19. With your Verify, I'm Evan Kozloff, five on your side. <laughs>Introduce you to Rob Shanahan. He's a photographer who works with the likes of Mick Jagger and Ringo Starr. Pretty cool. In part two of our interview, we learn more about the stories behind the iconic photos. Check it out. Welcome, Rob Shanahan, to Daily Blast Live. Now, earlier, you told us about your journey into music, photography, and the story behind one of your most recognizable photos of Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. But I want to get more stories of some uh, behind the scenes on the, some of these photos. So first up, we got yeah. Joey Kramer and Steven Tyler of Aerosmith looking very excited. Oh, yeah, Aerosmith. Anytime I get to work with those guys, you know, it's exactly how you would hope they would be. Okay, that's good. It's I wanted me. to know that. They're the same guys. Steven Tyler is exactly the guy you see on okay, TV yeah. or, or see on stage. Amazing and, you know, one of my all-time favorite rock bands growing up, Aerosmith. Come on, we're all such huge Aerosmith fans. So working with those guys has always been a real treat. And again, you know, they let me go on stage during the show. Uh, that shot was, you know, just a moment on stage with Aerosmith, you know, they're their shows are so high energy and yeah. I wanted to capture some of that energy into a frame and you know great story behind you know shooting on stage with Aerosmith one time Steven Tyler comes up as I'm standing on stage he comes up and starts singing into my camera like the way and gets a little closer and he decides he needs to clean my lens so and takes a scarf and he cleans my lens that's in the middle of the so show. Good. That's so good. It's such a good Aerosmith scarf story because he does have a lot of them. They're always around, so that's helpful. Yeah. For yeah, great show, great band. You know, I, I enjoy working with those guys. Really amazing. That's amazing. All right, last one is a backstage photo of Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones and Ringo Starr. Tell me about this. So it was 2009. The Rolling Stones were here in town. Uh, playing at Dodger Stadium. So I called Ringo. I'm like, man, Charlie Watts is in town. When's the last time you guys got together? So I made a few other phone calls and the next day we we got together at Ringo's house and that photo was just another split second of time. Ringo was showing Charlie something on this electronic drum kit in his house and he got up and handed the sticks to Charlie. Hey, check it out, Charlie. And Charlie grabbed the sticks and he came back and he sat down. What I love about that photo mm. is if you look at their faces and see the smiles, it's so genuine. Yeah. You know, and I look back at all the photos and you know, it's been a good long run and I'm really happy with uh, what we've done. And my first book came out 2011, mm. it's been a while. And Ringo, you know, God bless him, wrote the foreword for my book. And when my book came out, 
my friends from back home, you know, small town Minnesota where I grew up, freaked out. You got Ringo Starr to write the forward to your book. All right, this leads me into a question about Ringo. But as his personal photographer, you had a front row seats to his later years. So what has that experience been like? Are y'all close? Are you artistically kind of matched? How did that work? I've had a really great long run with Ringo Starr. You know, such an iconic, amazing drummer. And you know, to have that opportunity has been out of this world. And I have to thank Sheila E for that. You know, I heard great, about this, yeah. Beautiful Sheila E, I love so much. Uh, I started working with her late 90s. And uh, you know, I've been doing all her records and drum ads for the drum manufacturers. And her and I connected on such a level. And you know, when she got the call to do the All-Star Tour, you know, she pulled me in and introduced me to Ringo backstage. That's amazing. Rob Shanahan, it has been an absolute pleasure. Now, to see more Thank of you. Rob's work and maybe get something for your walls or the music fan in your life, check out robshanahan.com and be sure to check out Rob's book, Volume 1, Through the Lens of a Music Photographer. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Promotional Consideration is brought to you by... The Verify team is here to break down rumors, and we do so by going to the vetted experts. Maybe you've seen tweets like this, pharmaceuticals are immune to vaccine lawsuits, saying that you can't sue over severe side effects or death caused by the vaccine. So let's verify. Do pharmaceutical companies have legal immunity? Our sources are a pair of law professors, Peter Myers from GW Law and Lawrence Gostin from Georgetown Law. First off, medical experts emphasize that severe symptoms are very rare. That was studied before the vaccines were approved. But what about for those who do have severe reactions? Can pharmaceutical companies be sued by them? If you just have an, uh, an adverse effect or an illness that results from a vaccination, you can't sue them. The basis for this is something called the PrEP Act short for the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. In times of public health emergencies, it offers some liability protection to vaccine makers, but not complete immunity. You could still sue if there's what's called willful misconduct. They can mislead, deceive, be fraudulent, hide information. The PREP Act also created a fund for those impacted by vaccine side effects called the CICP. Countermeasures, injury compensation program. Those who suffered injuries from the vaccine can apply for compensation. For your lost income, um, for you know whatever medical expenses you've incurred. So we can verify that yes, pharmaceutical companies do have some protection against lawsuits, but not total immunity. Social media is being entirely misleading in saying that vaccine companies just get a get of jail free pass. With your Verify, I'm Evan Kozlov for Mile High Mornings. DBL is all new every day. Don't look at me like with that face because I'm telling you how I feel. I'm not buying his story. No, I'm just being honest. <laughs> He's trying to get clout. I'm gonna wear a 10-gallon hat. Stick with <laughs> us in 2021. We're gonna have a great year. <laughs>
Welcome back to DBL. It is time for some sweet, sweet deals because earlier I showed Tori some amazing products at even better prices. Check it out this week's DBL Deal Blast presented by MorningSafe.com. All right, what do you have for us today, Stephanie? So first up, we've got the 40-pack Vese KN95 disposable face masks. Wow. I love this. So normally, these are as much as $64. Uh, it's a little pricey, let's We've see. got them for $19. Woohoo! up to 70%. Okay, next up, love this one, product of the week for me. Ooh. It's the Cuisinart Easy Pop Hot Air Popcorn Maker. Oh, yeah. And it makes up to 15 cups of popcorn in under three minutes. Normally, it's $75. Ooh. We've got it for only 29, saving our viewers 61%. Toy, if you're like me, your skin's health is an absolute priority. Absolutely. Well, this Quench Micro Water Complex 8-piece skincare set is perfect for just that. So it's eight pieces, and it's got everything you could ever need. You've got exfoliators, moisturizers, anti-aging, and it'll smooth your skin. So normally this set is $400. Oh, oh. Yeah, we've got it. You're not going to believe this. So four 49, saving up to 88%. And last but not least, we've got something that's going to give you a good night's rest after a long day. It's the two-pack L Decor 225 Thread Count Hypo Energetic Pillow. Oh, I love pillows. And they're made of a finely woven, breathable, 100% cotton cover nice. for comfort. Normally, it's as much as 60 or $68, yeah. depending on, obviously, the size that you guys buy. But we've got them from $29.00 saving our viewers 57 percent. When you started with 20 something I was like I'm already in. Pillows are everything during the pandemic because I literally live in my bed. Oh yeah we all need a good night's sleep. It's so important so for your important. health and your well-being. Head on over to MorningSave.com to snag these amazing deals at the lowest prices. You guys can even visit MorningSave.com on your smartphone. Thanks so much Steph. Sweet deals. Let's get back to the monarchy. Monarch why can't I say that monarchy. today? Monarchy. Monarchy it's today. It's a tough way I know. To I don't say. know why I tried to say it one more time. But let's get back to there. What are you expecting uh, on Sunday's interview, Steph? Um, I don't think there's going to be a great deal of information that we don't already know. I think it's just going to be bringing to light a bit digging a slightly deeper, but I, I think if you watch The Crown and if you followed Diana's story, there's not going to be anything that's completely earth shattering. The firm, that clip we just showed was kind of... We heard Diana say that, though. I mean, I feel like she is repeating some things. I think it's very tactical, and I think she's following her footsteps for a reason. It's going to be interesting to chat on Monday, Steph, about the whole thing and how it went down. All right, guys, DBL's new every day. We'll see you manana.